So thanks to the committee for giving me the opportunity to share some of my research with you all here. I um, am really excited to get to share some of these ideas with you. Uh, this talk, uh, in the spirit of phenomenology, takes us back to the beginning, uh, to the logical investigations where phenomenology began, at least um, uh, uh, as a presentation. Uh, this paper that I'm reading is part of a larger project on Husserl's conceptions of rationality, teleology, and truth. I think that this is a raft of concepts that should be treated together and often aren't. And my focus in this paper and in a series of other papers is on the logical investigations where I think these three concepts are treated in relation to judgment, conceiving of judgment as an act of consciousness, as something that's done, uh, even though that isn't often thematized in the text. So let's begin. A recent trend in Husserl scholarship takes the Logosha Untersuchungen as advancing an irredeemably confused doctrine of perceptual experience. Within the confines of the same work, these commentators claim, Husserl advances both conceptualist and non-conceptualist doctrines about perceptual content. However, they continue, Husserl's eventual recognition of this confusion in his early work spurred a gradual growth out of inconsistency into the light of the transcendental philosophy of intentionality and the nature of knowledge presented in his later works. While I agree that there is a distinctive development to be found in Husserl's corpus, I believe that the familiar story just related rests on a deep misunderstanding of the analysis of perceptual experience and fulfillment that's presented in logical investigations. And I'll just say LI from now on, even though it says LU on the, up there. For there is no confusion over conceptualism in LI. Rather, as I will argue here, LI presents a consistent view of the nature and intentional content of perception, which can easily be misread as self-contradictory since it combines a conceptualist view of perceptual content or matter with a non-conceptualist view of perceptual acts. My goal for this paper is to present the initial, the initial critical steps in a fully fledged defense of this claim. Uh, in the first section, I present the basics of Husserl's analysis of intentionality and the act of fulfillment. Close scrutiny of the latter, I believe, highlights a core conceptualist commitment that the type of intentional content or matter instanced in perception can also be instanced in judgment and belief in any other propositional act. In section two, I present the charge of inconsistency over, over conceptualism brought against LI by recent commentators. And in section three, I argue that this charge rests on a misreading of the sections in logical investigations, specifically uh, uh, investigation six, section four, where these commentators locate the core argument for non-conceptualism about intentional content in perception. According to Husserl, every act of consciousness has two interdependent, yet independently variable aspects. One of these is the act's matter. Uh, this is a part of the act which determines the act's total intentional bearing on the world. The matter determines not only which object the act is intentionally directed at, but also as what the act characterizes its object. That is, what properties the act presents its object as having. The other aspect is the act's quality. This is a part of the act that determines, quote, whether what is already presented in definite fashion in the act's matter, that is, is intentionally presented as, for example, wished, asked, posited in judgment, etc. end quote. Husserl calls the specific combination of matter and quality instance in an act the intentional essence of the act. In this connection, it's always important to distinguish the abstract or ideal essence from the parts or moments in an intentional act that realize or instantiate this essence. When you and I both believe that the cherry trees in Central Park are in bloom, we each have a numerically distinct cognitive experience. Nevertheless, because, we are both because these are both believings about the same thing, they share a set of type identical features that constitutes the abstract intentional essence realized in each. 
And our two, ex our two experiences are, in other words, distinct tokens of the same type of intentional essence. Husserl makes clear from early on in L.I. that the distinction between types and the moments that realize or instantiate them plays a crucial role in the analysis of intentionality given therein. Where this distinction is important in the following, I will refer to the particular parts of a concrete whole as moments or instances, and I'll refer to the abstract essences instantiated in these moments as species, types, or ideal essences. These two distinctions are deployed in Husserl's phenomenological analysis of the structure of the experience of knowledge, which is communicated in the sixth investigation. This analysis focuses on articulating the structures of evidence, a term that refers to the distinctive experiential quality of an experience that marks it from within the first person perspective as being an experience of knowledge. The analysis hinges on there being a phenomenological difference between the experiences of knowing that such and such is the case on the one hand and thinking or merely believing that such and such is the case on the other. Husserl calls the former a fulfilled intentional experience and the latter an unfulfilled or signative intentional experience. For example, suppose I believe the cherry trees in Central Park are in bloom simply on the basis of reading a report in the newspaper that's a signative act. But then, because of my zeal for cherry blossoms, I go to the park and see the cherry trees for myself, intuition, thereby confirming my belief, fulfilled intentional experience. Husserl calls this kind of experience, an experience of, uh, which is an experience of seeing something to be just as I believe it to be, an act of fulfillment. Husserl maintains that every act of fulfillment is a complex act, that is, roughly, an act that is composed of acts and whose total intentional reference is the sum of the intentional references of its part acts. These part acts are, one, an empty signative act, uh, for example, an experience of believing or supposing that the cherry trees in Central Park are in bloom. Two, an intuitive act directed at the same object or state of affairs intended by the signative act, for example, a perceptual experience of the cherry trees in Central Park in bloom. And three, a recognition that the intentional object of the intuitive act is the same and has more or less the same properties as the intentional act of the signative, the intentional object of the signative act, or with reference to the essence of these acts, that the moments of matter instanced in the signative and intuitive acts stand in a relation of coincidence. The German there is Deckung. Within the unity of an act of fulfillment, the intuitive act confirms or justifies the signative act by, quote, offering it fullness. This is what Husserl says. This confirmation of the content of the signative act constitutes a new appearance of the object, the appearance of the object as known to be, or more or less just as, uh, more or less just as it is presented in the signative act. Um, now, there is uh, another, another problem that I should mention in relation to fullness, which is just what is the constitution of fullness itself. And in the longer version of this paper that I have on my website, I address that, that issue. But the paper is much too long for me to really get into that issue with the amount of time I have uh, here. So if you want to know about that, you can ask me during Q&A or, or find the paper online. Husserl calls the combination of the intentional essence of the act with the degree of fullness with which an object is presented the epistemic essence of the act. The complete articulation of the epistemic essence of every possible intentional act is really the grand ambition of Husserl's phenomenological epistemology in L.I. And the elucidation of the ideal essential structure of the act of fulfillment in perceptual judgment is the heart of this project. That's the part he actually carries out in launch investigations. For if we can elucidate the ideal essential st structure instanced in those experiences wherein perceptual experience makes the truth of a judgment manifest, then this could serve as the touchstone for the theory of knowledge in other domains. For it would deliver an articulation of the fundamental structures of consciousness by which intuitive experience becomes reason giving or justifying. 
A key point in all of this for the argument to follow is the claim that the type identity of moments of matter in the intuitive and signative acts is the core of what Husserl means by coincidence, or in German, Deckung, in fulfillment. Now, I concede that this point is obscured in the text of Li by the fact that Husserl starts out using the term Deckung in a weaker sense, which does not entail type identity. Uh, see especially uh, section six through eight of the sixth investigation, where he leaves unspecified how two acts in the unity of fulfillment achieve reference to the same object as being much the same. And so, some readers might come away from the text of Li with the impression that Deckung does not involve type identity. However, a key result of a line of investigation starting in section nine of the sixth investigation and coming to a conclusion in section 26 of the sixth investigation is that Deckung does involve type identity. As Husserl puts it in the initial formulation of this conclusion, um, let's see, yeah, and this is in section 25, it is clear that the concept of matter is defined through the unity of a total identification, namely as that in the act which serves as the basis of identification, and consequently that all the many determining differences of fullness, all the peculiarities of fulfillment and increase in fulfillment going beyond mere identification are not to factor in the formation of this concept. In whatever way the fullness of a presentation varies within its possible gradients of fulfillment, its intentional object, what and as what it is intended, remains the same. In other words, its matter remains the same. Briefly, the key point Husserl is making here is that the unity of total identification which serves as the basis of identification, that is the unity of decum between um, two presentations in fulfillment is just when the moments of matter in each are type identical, or, as Husserl puts it, when the matter remains the same despite the differences in degrees of fullness between the two acts. Of course, even with this passage's proof text, the defenses of the weaker reading of Deckung are not yet exhausted. While I do not have space in this paper to respond systematically to all of these, I will confront its primary bulwark the lack of an interpretation of Husserl's view of perceptual content that makes clear how an endorsement of conceptualism about perceptual content is compatible with the passages and implications of doctrines in logical investigations that seem to deny it. In setting up the controversy over conceptualism in the next section, I will proceed as if the reading of Deckung as involving the at least partial type identity of matters is correct. And starting in section four, uh, sorry, that should be the next section. Uh, hold on a second. I have the section numbering all messed up. Um, oh, basically I just don't talk about that part, so I won't read that sentence to you. Sorry about that little hiccup. Henceforth, I'll refer to the strong reading of Deckung as involving the type identity of matter between intuitive and signative acts as the conceptualist core of Husserl's analysis of fulfillment. The conceptualist core of Husserl's analysis of fulfillment is strikingly similar to the conceptualism about perceptual content, as this is understood, uh, in recent debates over non-conceptual content in philosophy of perception. John McDowell, in his paradigmatic presentation of conceptualism in a book titled Mind and World, specifies what it is for an intentional content to be conceptual in the following way. In particular, experience in which one is not misled, in a particular experience in which one is, one is not misled, what one takes in is that things are thus and so. That things are thus and so is the content of the experience. And it can also be the content of a judgment. It becomes the content of a judgment if the subject decides to take the experience at face value. So it is conceptual content. The statement of conceptualism about content here is a near equivalent to the conceptualist core fulfillment elucidated in what I've just said. As Husserl says, to every intuitive intention there pertains in the sense of an ideal possibility, a signative intention exactly accommodating its matter. Therefore, we have grounds for the claim that there is indeed a commitment at the heart of Husserl's view about perceptual content that would be recognized today as distinctly, distinctively conceptualist. Now, I know Husserl didn't 
use these terms, conceptual content, non-conceptual content, um, as key themes. Uh, but what philosophers are doing these days, Husserl commentators are doing these days, are drawing parallels between the kinds of things Husserl says and what conceptualists today uh, are saying conceptualism is. Moreover, there is a resemblance between the ways McDowell and Husserl motivate conceptualism. For each argues that perceptual experience can secure the epistemic function of evidence, as Husserl calls it, or of being a reason for belief, as McDowell says it, only if the intentional content of perception can also be the content of belief. So I think they share that epistemic commitment. Alongside these striking similarities, however, there is one important difference that must be noted here. Mm, did I want that? Hold on a second. Yeah, I do want that. Where McDowell claims that the conceptualism about perceptual content involves taking it to have a propositional structure, Husserl's conceptualism only requires that the matter of perception can also be at least part of the total matter of a possible judgment or other kind of signative act. Husserl maintains that the matter or interpretive sense of a straightforward perception is importantly different in type from the matter of a statement, aussage, an act with propositional content. So I take aussage to be a blanket term that applies to any act with propositional content in the logical investigations. For while Husserl takes the subject and predicate presentations in the unity of a complex propositional matter to represent their objects like a perception does, that is, in a straightforward, nominal fashion, they are united in this synthetic presentation by virtue of the imposition of a new form, a subject or predicate form that is not already found in the matter of a straightforward object perception. Yet, one must notice, even though there is more to the propositionally structured matter of a judgment than is in the matter of straightforward perceptual experience. This does not preclude, indeed it presupposes, the possibility that, quote, the new propositional form includes the whole old interpretive sense in itself and only grants it the sense of a new role, close quote. That's something Husserl says in the fifth investigation, uh, or sixth investigation, section 49, if you want to look it up on your computer real quick. Uh, also compare Logical Investigation 5, Section 36. So even though Husserl does not claim that the matter of straightforward perception is already formed in a way that would allow it to serve a subject or predicate role in the matter of an act of judgment, he nevertheless maintains that the matter of a straightforward perception can be imported into the matter of a belief or judgment after it's, after it's been appropriately shaped by a subjective synth synthetic operations. Therefore, Husserl's conceptualism is weaker than McDowell's, insofar as it holds that the total matter of perception lacks propositional structure, and that it can only be a part of the total matter of a judgment. McDowell thinks that the, the matter of perception is, is already propositional in form, that seeing things is kind of like having a cacophony of voices saying things to you. That's a very rough characterization of his view, but you sort of get the sense of it. But according to recent commentators, even this weak T conceptualism is enough to create inconsistencies in LI. These commentators locate the main arguments for the claim that the matter of a perception cannot also be instanced as part of the matter of belief, judgment, or other signative acts in Logical Investigation 6, Section 4. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, I mean books, to that section really quick, go ahead and take a look. <laughs> That Husserl is arguing for this non-conceptualist thesis here might seem obvious just from the section title. The expression of a perception, perceptual judgment, its meaning cannot lie in perception, but must lie in peculiar expressive acts. But to see more clearly how they read this as an expression of non-conceptualism, we must first understand what Husserl means by the term perceptual judgment. This term is defined in Logical Investigation 6, Section 3, as meaning a kind of experience in which, quote, I derive my judgment from my perception that I do not only assert the relevant matter of fact, but I perceive it and assert it as I perceive it. The judgment here is not concerned with the perception, but with the perceived. 
Perceptual judgment is then not introspective judgment, that is judgment about the perceptual experience itself, but judgment about the object of the perceptual experience, about the object that appears to one in the experience. Per the structure of Husserl's conception of intentionality, um, if an expression of a perception is an expression that refers to the intentional object of the perceptual experience, then it is also an expression, albeit in a different sense of the term, of the matter of the perceptual act. And so, here Husserl must be claiming that the matter expressed in judgment cannot lie in perception, but must lie in peculiar expressive acts. That's the, what the title says, right? This, in turn, suggests to commentators that the matter of the expression of the perception, that is, the matter of the judgment that's given, is peculiar to the linguistic act in the sense that the ideal type of matter instanced in the linguistic act of perceptual judgment cannot also be instanced in the perceptual experience that grounds the judgment. They have to be two radically distinct types of matter. In other words, it seems that we could paraphrase the overall conclusion, at least as expressed in the title of Logical Investigation 6, Section 4, as non-conceptualism. The type of matter or meaning of perception cannot also be instanced in the sense-giving or meaning-conferring acts of thinking, judging, and believing. Okay. The central line of argument for non-conceptualism that these commentators see in Section 4 and even Section 5 is Premise one, numerically distinct perceptual judgments that instantiate different types of matter could be based on the same perception. Two, the same perceptual judgment with no alteration in its matter could be based on numerically distinct perceptions that instantiate different types of matter. Three, the same perceptual judgment can suffer no alteration in matter even after the perception is, it is based on has ceased. Therefore, the matter instanced in perceptual experience is non-conceptual. That is, the matter of perceptual judgment is not instanced in a perceptual experience, even when that experience serves as the foundation of the perceptual judgment. You guys got that? Let's illustrate it. Suppose I have a visual experience of a blossoming cherry tree. Premise one says, any of the following judgments could be based on this experience, even though each judgment instantiates a distinct type of matter. The cherry tree is in bloom. There are pink flowers on that tree. This cherry tree is thriving. This cherry tree is beautiful. Premise two, I could base the same perceptual judgment, for example, this cherry tree is in bloom, on a variety of different perceptual experiences. A visual experience of the tree from the street, from the top of the neighboring building, or as depicted on a television screen, across town from a live feed on a security camera. None of the variations in perceptual experience affects a change in the matter of the expression. What does premise three say? Suppose that I judge the cherry tree is in bloom while gazing at the tree in bloom, but then I lie down in the grass, close my eyes, and make the same judgment. Even after perceptual experience of the tree has altogether ceased, my judgment can have the same matter as the judgment made while gazing at the tree. Therefore, the conclusion stated in four, what these possible variations in perception and judgment show is that the matter of my perception and the matter of my judgment can vary freely in relation to one another, at least after the perceptual judgment is made in relation to a perceptual experience that presents the object judged about. Therefore, the matter instance in perception is distinct from the matter instance in a signative expression of perceptual judgment. These commentators take this claim, that is the conclusion, to be expressed by Husserl in passages such as the following, which is found at the end of LI 6, section 5. If we may trust our arguments, it must not only draw a general distinction between the perceptual and significant elements in the statements of perception, we must also locate no part of the meaning in the perception itself. However, the ambivalence that these commentators detect in Husserl's thinking about non-conceptualism emerges clearly in the very next sentence, which, when read with the interpretation of coincidence as involving type identity, seems to deliver an unabashed endorsement of conceptualism about perceptual content. So check this out. Came right after the sentence we just saw. The perception which presents the object and the statement which by way of the judgment or otherwise expressed by way of the thought act woven into the unity of the judgment, thinks and expresses it, must be rigorously kept apart. 
even though, in the case of the perceptual judgment now being considered, they stand to each other in the most intimate interrelation, the relation of coincidence or the unity of fulfillment. Puzzling indeed. Many commentators maintain that at junctures like this, Husserl is fundamentally confused. However, I want to argue that these passages actually express a consistent view. For while Logical Investigation 6, Section 4 is advancing an argument for a non-conceptualist thesis, it is a kind of non-conceptualism about perceptual experience that is compatible with the conceptualist core of Husserl's analysis of fulfillment. A non-conceptualist thesis about the nature of perceptual acts that's different from the conceptualist thesis about perceptual contents or, more precisely, matters. A clue that this is the case is suggested by Leung's response to the inconsistency in Husserl's thought that arises on his reading. Uh, Leung argues that we, readers of Husserl, so this is in an article in Husserl Studies published about four years ago, um, that we, um, uh, we, we readers of Husserl, intent on understanding the view that Husserl was attempting to articulate in L.I., can simply set aside the slips of thought in Logical Investigation 6, Section 4, because the argument for non-conceptualism it contains is not sound. You may have already noticed this if you were paying attention. As Lung points out, the independent variability of matters instanced in perception and associated perceptual judgment only demonstrates that the matters instanced in each are numerically distinct, but not that they cannot be distinct instances of the same type. As Leung puts it, what it can accomplish is only the assurance that the intuitive act is not essential to the phenomenon of meaning and that expression is still meaningful even without the corresponding intuition. But it is not enough to exclude the possibility that the intuitive act is also meaningful even without uniting with the meaning-conferring act in the synthetic act of fulfillment. Thus, it might still be sense-giving in itself Husserl seems to have neglected to consider the possibility that intuition or perception is essentially sense-giving in the sense that it has always already been united with a meaning-conferring act insofar as it is an intuition, that is, insofar as it is an intuitively intentional act. Astounding. However, this criticism of the argument of Logical Investigation 6, Section 4 could also suggest, and this is something that Leung doesn't recognize, that we've been misreading the conclusion of the argument therein. That Husserl is not arguing for a non-conceptualism about the matter instance in a perceptual state at all, but rather a non-conceptualism about the perceptual act or state as a whole. An adumbration, as an adumbration of the more thorough elaboration of this distinction to follow, let's characterize it in the following way. Content non-conceptualism or matter non-conceptualism on the one hand claims that the same type of intentional content presented in a perceptual act cannot also be present as content in a belief or judgment. State or act non-conceptualism, on the other hand, claims that in order for a subject to have a perceptual experience with a certain kind of intentional content or, or matter, the subject need not possess any of the concepts deployed in a correct characterization of the content of one's perceptual experience. Content non-conceptualism, then, is a thesis about the intentional content of perceptual experience and the kinds of act in which it can serve as a uh, part, at least a part of the total intentional content. Whereas act non-conceptualism is a thesis about the kinds of intentional acts or mental states that can, the subject can have. What I'm claiming about Logical Investigation 6, Section 4, then, is that it communicates an argument for act non-conceptualism, that is, for a claim that the conditions that must be satisfied by an act of consciousness to qualify as a perceptual act are not the same as the conditions that must be satisfied for an act to qualify as a propositional act. In light of this brief characterization of act non-conceptualism, and we'll return to it and elucidate it further in what follows, we can see another clue that this is the thesis Husserl is pursuing in Logical Investigation 6, Section 4, uh, which, comes at the end of log um, which comes at the end of Logical Investigation 6, Section 3. There, Husserl delivers a statement of the general question to be pursued in the following sections, and I think in particular sections 5 through 9. Um, he writes, in connection with the new defined sense of expressed act, that is in relation to the notion of perceptual judgment, we wish to make clear the whole relation between meaning 
and expressed intuition. We wish to consider whether such an intuition may not itself be the act constitutive of meaning, or if this is not the case, how the relation between them may be best understood and systematically classified. We are now heading towards a more general question. Do the acts which give expression in general and the acts which in general are capable of receiving expression belong to essentially different spheres and thereby, um, sorry, do the acts which give expression in general and the acts which in general are capable of receiving expression belong to essentially different spheres and thereby to firmly delimited act species? That's the question he's gonna pursue. What should stand out to us in this passage now is that Husserl does not say that he's setting out to find out whether the same type of matter can be instanced both in intuition and in propositional acts, but that he is setting out to determine whether the act of intuition and the act of expression are of the same specific type or as he puts it here, of the same firmly delimited act species. In other words, it should be clear to us now that Husserl is not saying that the arguments of LI6 section four do not concern the question, uh, he, sorry, he's saying that the arguments of LI6 section four do not concern the question of matter or content non-conceptualism, but instead the question of act or state non-conceptualism. Okay. In light of this, we can interpret away the alleged inconsistency over non-conceptualism in Logical Investigation 6. Husserl decides in favor of act non-conceptualism as a result of the arguments in LI6 section four and, and five, I should say, and he decides in favor of matter non-conceptualism as expressed in the conceptualist core of fulfillment. It comes as a result of the investigations in Logical Investigation 6, six section six through 26. So what recent interpreters take to be a self-contradictory tangle in LI is actually not that at all. Rather, it is the expression of a hybrid view of perceptual content, which combines act non-conceptualism with matter conceptualism. Okay. Now, in order to make this interpretation clearer, because I know it's not altogether clear yet, and more compelling, I hope. I will do the following. One, introduce the distinction between state and content non-conceptualism as this has been formulated in the recent analytic debate over non-conceptual content in the writings of Richard Heck and, um, and, and others as well. Two, to show how Heck's way of formulating this distinction must be substantially modified before it can be applied as a characterization of Husserl's view in LI. And three, to demonstrate that the Husserlian view that emerges, a hybrid view that combines non-conceptualism about perceptual acts with conceptualism about the matter of perceptual acts is internally consistent. I start on the first task by reviewing the introduction of the relevant distinction in, to the contemporary debate in the work of Richard Heck. Using a formulation due to Josefa Toribio, we can express Heck's distinction as follows. Content non-conceptualism. For any perceptual experience E with content C, C is content non-conceptualism if and only if C is essentially different in kind from the content of beliefs. State non-conceptualism. For any perceptual experience E with content C, any subject S and any time T E is state non-conceptualism, if and only if it is not the case that in order for S to undergo E, S must possess at T the concepts that a correct characterization of C would involve. Now, to illustrate through an example, according to content non-conceptualism, in order to accurately describe my perceptual experience as being of a blossoming cherry tree, the intentional content of this experience must be such that it cannot also serve as the intentional content of the belief that the cherry tree is in bloom. On the other hand, according to state non-conceptualism, in order to accurately describe my perceptual experience as being of a blossoming cherry tree, I need not possess and deploy, as those in the contemporary literature like to say, the concepts blossoming and cherry tree. I need not be able to engage in those kinds of acts in order for myself to be able to see the blossoming cherry tree, in other words. According to Heck, these claims are logically independent of each other.
According to content non-conceptualism, the intentional content of my perceptual experience has no direct bearing on whether I can or cannot deploy the relevant concepts in a judgment or inference. And since this goes for content non-conceptualism, it also goes for content conceptualism. Thus, even if the content of my perceptual experience of a blossoming cherry tree could also be uh, at least a part of the content of a belief, this does not entail that I must possess in the relevant sense the concepts blossoming in cherry tree. Indeed, this condition of the content of my perceptual experience entails nothing about my conceptual capacities at all. In regards to state non-conceptualism, the claim that I do not possess concepts that correctly characterize the content of my perceptual experience implies nothing about whether this content can also be the content of a belief or not. So it seems we have a clear conceptual distinction between content and state varieties of non-conceptualism. As Heck and others have noted, the distinction between two concepts of non-conceptualism is of use in blocking certain influential objections to conceptualism. Take, for instance, uh, Speaks's argument, given in a 2005 paper, that the, fineness of uh, that the fineness of grain argument against conceptualism only supports state non-conceptualism, not content non-conceptualism. So the fineness of grain argument is based on the idea that the content of our perceptual experience far outstrips the concepts that a perceiving subject possesses. So that, for example, I don't have a color concept for every specific shade of color that is present in, my, in many of my visual experiences. Upon grasping the distinction between state and content non-conceptualism, however, we can see, that the, flaw, we can see the flaw, that the flaw in this argument is to confuse the conditions of a perceptual experience's having a certain kind of content, a content that can also be the content of a belief, if we're Husserl, and the conditions of a subject's possessing concepts that, correct, concepts that correctly characterize a content. Those are two different things. Once we distinguish the former from the latter, we can see that it is possible for a perceptual experience to have a content that can also be the content of a belief or judgment, that is, it's conceptual in the sense of content conceptualism, without the subject of that experience possessing concepts that would correctly characterize this content. The distinction between these two varieties of non-conceptualism must be modified in three important ways before applying it in a description of Husserl's position. First, we must bring Husserl's instantiation conception of meaning to bear. That's what I call the idea that matters or instance in acts. Heck's formulation of the distinction comes about in an engagement with Gareth Evans's 1982 conception of non-conceptual content. As such, it assumes a conception of intentionality that is largely influenced by Frege's approach to linguistic meaning. This conception recognizes a fundamental tripartite distinction between the act of meaning, the object meant, uh, Frege's Bedeutung, and the intentional content, meaning, or sense, Zin, of the act. This is the way Frege uses these terms. Husserl fundamentally agrees with this tripartite distinction, but there is at least one important difference, and there are others, aside from just this one. For the Neo-Fregians, especially after the work of Michael Dummett, it is best to remain as neutral as possible about the relation about the nature of the relation between the subject and the intentional content of her mental states. Down that path lies dangerous Platonism with lots of problems, if you're a naturalist. So many have opted to characterize this relation largely in terms of subjective psychological capacities. For example, a capacity to draw a certain kind of inference. Husserl, on the other hand, advances what would strike these neo as a dangerously metaphysically loaded characterization of the relation between intentional content and act, namely, as being the realization or instantiation of a universal in a particular, or something very much like that, at least. This metaphysical flourish in Husserl's view, Husserl's view however, allows it to avoid a point of contention in the contemporary debate over non-conceptualism that abides even after recognizing the distinction between act and content varieties. This is the task of articulating the conditions of concept possession without taking on any unacceptable metaphysical commitments, which has proven to be very difficult, and I won't go into that debate. The Husserl of Ally can simply pass this difficulty by and characterize the metaphysical differences between acts in which the subject deploys the concepts, uh, to use the contemporary terminology, and those in which she doesn't, straightforwardly, as differences in the essential experiential structures instantiated in each. 
it's an easy question for him, right? Second, we need to remind ourselves of the fact noted above in relation to McDowell's conceptualism that Husserl's matter conceptualism does not require that the matter of perception have a propositional structure, but only that it can also be instanced as a part of the subject or predicate presentation in the unity of a propositional matter. That's absolutely crucial, by the way. Third, these two differences in Husserl's view entail a reduction of the distinction between hex, state, and content non-conceptualism to a distinction between a thesis about the total essence of the perceptual act in the, dis in, in the decision concerning act non-conceptualism, and a thesis about the essence of the matter instanced in a perceptual act in the decision concerning matter conceptualism. In other words, Husserl's content or matter conceptualism is a thesis only about a part of the total epistemic essence, that is, type of matter, quality, and fullness of a perceptual act. In particular, that the types of matter instanced in perceptual acts can also be instanced in an act of judgment. However, Husserl's act non-conceptualism is a thesis about the epistemic essence of the perceptual act as a whole. In particular, that the total essence of perception is in some way different from the total essence of an act of judgment. These observations set the stage for a demonstration of the consistency of Husserl's hybrid view. It's clear that, in general, we can acknowledge differences between the total natures of two things, while also acknowledging that they have some feature in common. For example, this shirt and that shirt are different styles. Oh, let me put the shirts up there. There we go. Different styles, but they have the same color. Or it's the other way around. The same style, but they have the same color. I didn't quite get my essences straight there. Since there's no reason to think that this same possibility does not hold for the relation between the total essences of two experiences, then there is no reason to think that the two following doctrines, which together, in my view, constitute Husserl's hybrid view of the content of perceptual experience, are inconsistent with one another. Conceptualism about perceptual matter, the intentional content or matter of any given perceptual state, can also be the part be a part of the, total, of the intentional content or matter of an act of judgment or belief. Non-conceptualism about perceptual acts. The total essence of a perceptual experience need not involve all of the elements necessary for an act to be an act of judgment or belief. In particular, it need not involve a propositionally structured matter. Thank you very much. Walter. I'll, I'll, I'll field the questions okay, if that's okay. I need to uh, take the microphone around. Oh, um, sure. I'll wait. I think it's here. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, first. Yeah. Chad, thanks so much. I know sure. we've talked about this before. Yeah. I, I just have a quick question. I thought that was great, and it puts a lot of pressure on my view. <laughs> But maybe a question, maybe some follow-ups. On the state non-conceptualist view, uh, I find every formulation of it to be incoherent. Yeah. Um, what does it mean for, to, for a subject to be in a state with a content such that they don't have the concepts to characterize that content? What does characterizing mean? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and it depends upon which uh, state non-conceptualism you're, you're talking about. Right. right. Um, it, they, they sometimes, uh, that's Terribio's way of putting it. Uh, it's but, everyone's way of putting it. I mean, yeah. it comes from Speaks, too. Yeah, yep. yeah. And um, Eck as well. I mean, it, 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 they're thinking that um, one of the conditions on possessing a concept, is their word, right, um, is to be able to deploy the concept in judgment. And if you presuppose that the content of your judgment is something you have some sort of privileged access to, that in judging, say, uh, that water is H2O, you have some access to the fact that that's what you're believing, uh, then that means that in deploying the concept of judgment, you also have the capacity to characterize yeah. that concept yeah, so, in yeah. some way. Okay, so, so that's, I mean, what they're just trying to say, look, a perceiver doesn't need to be able to do that in order for the content of a perception to be such that it's of 
a blossoming cherry tree. You should not be able to deploy the concept blossoming cherry tree in judgment. So here's my that's, problem. That's yeah. what they mean. But there's a whole swath of views here, and, and I do think they run into trouble, as I in indicated, yeah. uh, trying to account for possession conditions in ways that are metaphysically neutral enough for them. Okay, good. Right? Yeah, because um, my worry about that is if, if, if characterizing a content means that... Um, well, so if, if I have a concept, let me put it this way. If I'm able to characterize the, the, if I possess a concept just in case I can have a concept which is about that concept, mm -hmm. then it seems like I need meta concepts for all my concepts. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't seem like a good constraint. It seems to get us in the Burge position of hyper-intellectualization. Mm -hmm. It seems like children can have demonstrably conceptual contents, like that's a tree, yep. without having the concept of the concept of a tree. Mm -hmm. So characterizing shouldn't be being about a content. Yeah. On the other hand, if characterizing just means possessing it, then clearly when I, if, if the concept chair is part of my experience, a mm -hmm. constituent of the matter mm -hmm. of the experience, then I possess the concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure what they mean by possession here. Yeah. So, I mean, depending on what you mean by possession, it could be totally obvious. I'd love to hear more about that. Instantiation, I think, so yeah, if I instantiate yeah. a content, I possess it. Yeah, how could I instantiate I a content? in Husserl's sense, mm -hmm. and be in a mental state with that content as a constituent mm -hmm. without possessing it. It would be me having something without having it. Yeah. So if I can be in a mental state which contains as a constituent the concept chair, mm -hmm. it seems incoherent to turn around and say, oh, but you don't possess the concept chair. Yeah. Husserl would agree with that. Because yeah. remember the... Well, I think Husserl would, yeah. I yeah, the, like, I think even my Husserl would agree with that. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, that be, guy. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because I think that the, the relevant distinction here is, so the claim I'm making, content non-conceptualism is not, or state non-conceptualism about perception, is not saying that you somehow possess the concept, say, water, um, and, but you don't possess the capacity to characterize that concept. I, I think Husserl would be highly uh, allergic to that sort of view. I do too, but, right. Um, but what he is saying is that you can possess a intentional matter uh, that isn't yet the full-blown concept. So you can have a perceptual matter that is of a glass of water or of water um, without being able to deploy that in judgment, to be able to shape it in such a way, syntactically, I think he has in mind. In 49, um, it's clear, yeah. yeah to, to then deploy it in judgment. Okay. Um, that, that, I think, need not uh, be the case. Now, I started talking about capacities there, and that's dangerous in the logical investigations because that's not obviously his metaphysics of, of mind, so we'd have to be careful there as well. Anyway. Okay. Hey, thank you, Chad, for a fascinating talk. I am um, uh, very new to the Husserl world. Uh, this is actually my first uh, exposure to it, but uh, the, a lot of the questions that you're raising are familiar to me from uh, analytic uh, yeah. philosophy of perception or theories of perception. So I, I guess I'm looking for more clarification as to what Husserl has in mind by some of these uh, things that you've mentioned. Um, in particular, the way in which a perceptual um, state or the matter of perceptual state could be a part of uh, the um, the uh, perceptual judgment, and mm. so sometimes you use the language of part, uh, which makes me think myriology, right? It's it's, yep. a, it's a piece of uh, like mm -hmm. you know I don't know the like the leg of a chair could be part of the chair, yeah. uh, but sometimes you use the term element, and mm -hmm. sometimes you think of you you talk about it as being a, a sharing of properties, okay? So, um, mm -hmm. so so that you know there's there's a property that the perceptual state has that mm -hmm. the perceptual judgment also has, and yep. so it's in that sense part. So yep. I guess I was hoping that you could clarify what you mean and what you think Husserl means by this part um, terminology, mm -hmm. or what exactly is the relationship between the two of them yeah. in more detailed terms. And then I yeah. guess if you have time, just a, a very, very tangential to that, uh, you brought up the issue of uh, whether we have concepts for all the colors that we can um, mm -hmm. perceive and have in our first person point of view. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you could speak to the uh, typical rejoinder to that, which is that, you know, we can use comparative concepts or demonstrative concepts. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, more green than that thing or green mm -hmm. like this 
uh, or just this. Yeah. Uh, so you know, McDowell has take the demonstrative yeah. strategy. The other people yeah. take the comparative concept strategy. W what do you think about mm -hmm. those? Okay, thanks for those questions. Uh, I'll take the first one first because uh, I think it's 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 uh, a bit easier uh, to give a glib but also hopefully informative answer. Um, so. One of the things we always have to keep in mind when we're thinking about Husserl's theory of mental content is the distinction between um, essence and particular. Uh, and so he thinks that the, the meaning of an intentional act uh, is its essence as realized in the particular mental act. Uh, it's, it's, we, I, I'm comfortable saying it's a kind of token type, uh, sorry, a type token kind of relationship uh, though people could dispute that. Um, so whenever I say that the matter of a perceptual act could also be a part of the total matter of a judgment, I mean literally that whatever matter is instanced in that perceptual act could be either taken up into a perceptual judgment, so like a judgment in the stream of consciousness sort of enfolds it <laughs> um, in a subject or predicate, uh, or at least the same type of matter that's instanced there, something with the same properties, if we think of properties as abstracta, um, could also be instanced in a judgment as a part of, say, the subject or predicate uh, that's deployed in that judgment. And he does think of judge as judgments as having subject predicate structure. So he read Frege, but he didn't quite get the function uh, stuff. He didn't incorporate that. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, so I, I mean that really quite literally. Husserl does develop a muriology that uh, Kit Fine is very fond of, um, that he deploys to try to make sense of these kinds of part-whole relationships as applied to lived experiences. So he thinks you can actually do a muriology of lived experiences. They aren't just, they aren't quite, uh, the stream of consciousness is quite rich for him in this book. It's not a trickle like what we get out of, say, Gilbert Ryle, for instance. Does that help with the first question? You think? Yeah, there's a lot to be said here. I think there's a lot that's left unelucidated about this kind of shaping that's absolutely crucial um, for Husserl's overall project in epistemology. Um, but there's a lot more that could be said. Now, concerning the fineness of grain argument, um, I'm afraid that I myself don't have very many interesting uh, points of view on, on what McDowell has, what McDowell's response is. Um, and I'm not even really sure what Husserl would think about it. I, I do think that in, in general, the shape of his theory is such that he would be amenable to that sort of thing, um, that you can maybe abstract out of the perceptual field uh, certain phenomena that you could then demonstrate in thought. Uh, he does have at least the general sketch of a theory of demonstratives in the sixth investigation as well as in the first, I believe. Isn't that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's better in the six, it's more full. And it, it strikes me, I mean, this is contentious as well, but it strikes me as very similar to the kinds of things that David Kaplan has to say where he distinguishes, say, content from character. But he's not gonna go with Kaplan's Russellian reading of content in that regard. So I, I do think he would be amenable to, he would at least see the gist of McDowell's sort of response uh, in that regard. But thanks for the question. Yes, Rudolph. Thank you. Um, I have a simple question. Okay. Why are you doing this with the logical investigations and not with ideas one? Uh, to elaborate a little bit, I think there, it's very difficult to make a distinction between act conceptualism and content conceptualism in the logical investigations. Hmm. While there would be much room to do that in uh, ideas one. And then you keep referring to that issue of instantiation in yeah. logical investigations. Mm -hmm. Husserl very quickly understood that instantiation in terms of particularization of an essence in a real moment of the act didn't work. Mm -hmm. So he was looking for an alternative mm -hmm. model of individuation of the meaning in the concrete uh, mm -hmm. intentional e event. And uh, maybe the second thing 
isn't quite accomplished yet in ideas one, but at least the distinction between uh, uh, act conceptualism and, and concept, uh, 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 content conceptualism yeah. is much easier to, to, to develop on the basis of the uh, uh, ideas one. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when you say that uh, an, a perception uh, in order to be uh, uh, expressed in a proposition must be of the same kind. Mm -hmm. You didn't say what, who's his answer to that? Yes, because they are both objectifying acts. Mm. And what does make oh. an act into an objectifying act? The matter. So we are back mm. to, to the, so, so the act conceptualism and the content conceptualism, there is no room to, for making that distinction, according mm. to me in, in the logical investigations. There would be room. For, mm. for the more Phrygian uh, accounts of uh, content in, with the Neumann in ideas, one, I would it's suggest. Easier to do. It's easier to do. Um, great, now those are, that's a great question and really uh, great things to remind me of in ideas. So the answer to the preliminary question, which is why am I looking at logical investigations and not ideas, is because I, uh, basically want to start from the beginning in, in understanding um, how Husserl's concerns about <coughs> rationality um, as expressed in the formal transcendental logic and experience and judgment um, and the concerns about teleology might tie all the way back up to the prolegomena. That's sort of my overarching thing. So I'm working at the, pro the logical investigations first. That's not a very interesting answer. It's more biographical than theoretical. Um, but uh, I, I guess I just disagree with you that I, I do think that there is a way of doing a distinction between act and content non-conceptualism even within the framework of the, the, the theory, let's call it, uh, that's given in logical investigations. I, I, um, so I don't want to reiterate too much, but the, the, the act non-conceptualism is, is, these are, whether you're an act non-conceptualist or an act conceptualist, basically is a decision about whether you think the total um, intentional essence, let's just look at intentional essence, is the same or different between an intuitive act or, um, sorry, a per, let's just call it a perceptual act and an act of judgment, an assertive act, an aussage, right? And I do think that there's room to say that there are differences. Uh, there are differences in the matter instance in each. Um, one is, um, essentially propositionally, categorially structured, the other the perception is not. Um, but I think it's also important to notice something that you say he also wants to hold on to in, I, in the ideas, which is the matter um, conceptualism. That is the idea that the same moment of matter instanced in a perception can also be instanced as a total part of the matter instanced in judgment. And that's really crucial for articulating how it is that perception can then function as a reason for belief, to put it uh, in the contemporary terminology, as I read Logical Investigation 6. That's, that's the heart of fulfillment um, in Logical Investigation 6. Uh, I don't know whether that's still the heart of fulfillment in the ideas. I haven't um, answered that question for myself yet or not, but um, you seem to think that it might be. The characterization of content conceptualism you gave that it's, it's easy to see how the same kind of matter can be instanced in both perception and judgment. And you said, yes, it's because they're both positing. Um, objectifying. objectifying. Objectifying, yes. And that's, that's a concept also operative in logical investigations. Um, I mean, they're also both positing. But, um, but that's, that has nothing to do with the, with the matter. That's with more with what he would call quality. Um, they're both objectifying. That, that's a very interesting, perhaps, objection, ground for an objection, because then you could say, well, whatever matter conceptualism is, it's almost vacuous. <laughs> it just says they're both positing, but that doesn't really tell us very much um, about what in particular makes them the same um, in, the, in the way that I think um, Husserl needs in order for a perceptual judgment to, to work. Because remember, for a perceptual judgment, you have to, you have to um, express what it is that you're seeing, right? So a perceptual judgment would be this is black or this is a clicker, 
right? And there, what it is that's being seen must in some way match what it is that's being expressed uh, if that perceptual experience is going to fulfill or, uh, to use other terminology, verify the judgment. Does that, I don't know, does that contrast? We have much time, but uh, yeah. just remind yourself that that issue of expression of perception in a predicative statement goes together in logical investigations with the question whether non-objectifying acts can be expressed in language or in propositions mm. uh, in the same way as objectifying acts. So uh, the, 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 the whole issue of uh, 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 judgments of perception, as he calls them, goes to, must, must be read together with judgments about desires, this kind of mm. thing. You know, you, you, and so, so the, the, the fact that uh, uh, in order to allow for the expression of a perception, that this perception must be an objectifying act, is not mm -hmm. a trivial uh, statement no. because that uh, points to the difficulty uh, of expressing mm in a propositional uh, acts, non-objectifying acts, such mm. as desires. Yeah, thank you. And we do have about uh, five more minutes, so uh, one more question. Walter? I'll ask one real quick, <laughs> just because this is, yeah. Okay, so one question. Is this the gotcha question? No, okay. this is not. That's too <laughs> there I go, I'm a hooserl, I'm looking out my window, <laughs> I see the blackbird flying through the garden. Which concepts am I exercising? Hmm? Which concepts am I exercising? I don't know. Okay. I need to know more about what the particulars of the mental act. Yeah, so um, here I am holding this up. Which yeah. concepts are exemplified in the matter of your perceptual experience? Because, mm -hmm. so here's the objection, right? Uh, there's way too many. There's just way too many. There, there's, this is blue, this is a pen, Walter's mm. holding this, but mm -hmm. uh, a perceptual experience isn't worth a thousand words. It's worth at least a thousand propositions. Mm. And it looks like all of a sudden, uh, this is like a, a richness argument of a different sort. Mm. To saddle, to say that, the, that perception has the same content as a judgment, or the same matter as a judgment, mm -hmm. if and only if it could fulfill that judgment, and now we find for any particular visual experience, let's say, that it could fulfill a thousand judgments. Mm -hmm. let's, let's make it 50. Mm -hmm. Are there that many concepts or uh, operative in my, in my experience? No. Okay, so is there a good way that Not we could time. find out which you ones are and aren't, right? Mm -hmm. How do you find that out? Yeah, yeah, right, so what would be our procedure? Phenomenology. Okay. <laughs> 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 If you had this mic, you'd drop it. <laughs> sort of walk out of the room. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> All right, he's done, folks. <laughs> That's a conversation starter. Yeah, good. That's a conversation starter. Thank you.